We'll do the Eucharist second half. If you can return with me to the book of Romans. We'll do one more study out of it. You recall last time that we discovered three key words given by Paul in a description of the sin nature of man. and why it's important that we grasp an understanding of it. In verse 12, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body. He's talking about the sin nature. So that you obey its lust. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, and your members are parts of your body as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin, sin nature, shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. I want you to look at three key words. See the word reign? That's a throne on which somebody sets over authority. A reign, that's R-E-I. And where does it reign? Where's the seat of authority? It's in your mortal body. Meaning the body that you have from birth to death. That's why it's mortal. And you're told, by the way, that's a command, do not let sin reign. That's a command, a present active imperative. Do not let it reign so that you obey its lust. So, there's a seat of authority over the Christian life. He's talking to Christians. Over the Christian life, and whoever sits on that throne of authority is the master, as you'll see in a moment. And you decide who sits on it. Well, let's read it again. You... Do not let sin nature reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. The word reign is really important because who sits on that throne reigns over the Christian life. Okay? And it's either the sin nature or the indwelling Holy Spirit. Then a second imperative, do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present, that's another imperative, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. Whoever is on the throne of the authority over the Christian life dictates how the parts of your body are used to whom they serve. Let's just pause a moment. Let me, let me show you something. Go to Galatians with me. We're going to come back, so don't hold your place. Listen, if you didn't bring a Bible, start doing it. Or, if you don't have one, there's one in the pew. And if you don't want to have one at home, take it home. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. Now watch this, because here's the issue. Who sits on the throne reigns. Reign is a, a system of authority. I say, walk, that's an imperative, that's a command in the Greek language, a present imperative. I say, walk by the Spirit, Holy Spirit, indwelling Holy Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. See, we were told in Romans not to obey the lust of the flesh, the lust of the sin nature. The only authority that has power in the Christian life over the old sin nature is the indwelling Holy Spirit. It's either only two forces set on the throne of a Christian's life. Either the Holy Spirit who dwells inside you or, the old, or your sin nature. 
You understand that? There's, that's it. That's it. There's a seed of authority in the Christian life, and who sets on that authority will either be the sin nature or to be the indwelling Holy Spirit and will dictate how the Christian life is run. It will either direct it on the path of unrighteousness or the path of righteousness. That's Romans. So you're commanded to walk in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's your responsibility. The Holy Spirit is the only power over the sin nature. That's why they're in conflict. Watch, watch Galatians now. I'm in 517. For the flesh sin nature sets its desire against the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit sets its desire against the flesh. These are in opposition to one another. There's a constant internal warfare in every Christian life between the sin nature and the indwelling Holy Spirit. You say, well, when did I get the Holy Spirit? I didn't know I had the Holy Spirit. Yeah. At the point of salvation, you get the Holy Spirit. And these are at war with. Well, you go like, okay. Look, go back to Romans with me. Go back to Romans with me. We are in 12, 13, and 14. We are in Romans 6, 12, 13, and 14. In verse 14, For the sin, sin nature, shall not be master over you. Whoever sits on the throne, whoever reigns is master. It's one of two. It's either going to be the indwelling Holy Spirit, or it's going to be your sin nature. You are the one who chooses who sits on the throne of authority over your life. You're told to walk in the power of the Spirit because it is the power of the Holy Spirit over your sin nature. Go to Romans 8 with me for just a moment, then we'll have a word of prayer. How do I know I get the Holy Spirit the moment I believe the gospel of Christ? Verse 9, 10, and 11. Romans 8. However, you are not in the flesh, sin nature, that's mortal body business, but in the Spirit. If the Spirit of God dwells in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to Christ. When you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit does eight works at the moment of salvation in your life. Do you have that little pamphlet that says 50 things? Turn to that. There's a section in there that talks about the eight works of the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? One of those eight works is the indwelling. You need to know that stuff. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not saved. If you believe the gospel that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead... The moment you believe, you receive. Not only do you receive regeneration, being born again, but you receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. There are eight works of the Holy Spirit you get at the point of salvation. Verse 10, I'm in Romans 8, 10. If Christ is in you, he is in the representation of the Holy Spirit. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. If, but if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, it took the resurrection of Christ to put the Holy Spirit inside your life at the point of salvation. 
I didn't make that up. That's what Paul said. He who raised Jesus from the dead lives in your body and gives spiritual life to your mortal body. How does that benefit you? When, because you have eternal life in a mortal body through salvation in Jesus Christ, when you die, you go to heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. This is the only way it's, that works. There's no other way that works. You're not going to get, go to heaven because you're moral. You're not going to go to heaven because you're religious. You're going to go to heaven because you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day to put the Holy Spirit in you and to give you eternal life. You've got to understand this stuff. Paul has now advanced you past that to understand what the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is for. Now, there's, only, there's just a ton of reasons the Holy Spirit is in you. And we'll certainly get to a lot of that stuff. Not today, but we will get to a lot of that. That pamphlet you have talks about 50 things that you receive at the point of salvation you can never lose in time and eternity. That little pamphlet I gave you. You should take that home and you should study it. You should look up every one of those scriptures and read it because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. You need to know this stuff. You need to stop living in the defeat of the Christian life. The victory in the Christian life comes first and foremost after your salvation from you understanding how to be a spiritual person all the time. I'm talking about a 724. The Holy Spirit in John 14, 17 cannot leave you. He's there forever. And he's there for a good reason. That's the third member of the Godhead that lives inside of every mortal body that believes the gospel of Christ. Now today, I'm going to give you an exercise that will bring victory into your life on a steady basis. We call it, I call it, the circles of life. You must learn this. This will change your life forever. But you've got to understand how the Holy Spirit works in victorious ways in your life. You receive the Holy Spirit the moment... Now, listen, you say, well, I didn't know it. I know because you didn't study the scriptures. But now you know. I've given you this. Whether you wrote it on your paper or not, I don't know. I write a lot on your paper. A lot of stuff I give you is not on your paper. You should write down. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and he does, if you believe the gospel. He who raised Jesus from the dead will give life, that spiritual life, that's eternal life, in your mortal body. God puts eternal life inside your mortal body. So that when one day when you physically die and leave your mortal body, you'll go to the presence of the Lord because this has been established in your life at salvation. Write this down. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8 tells you to be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord. How does that work? Right there, that's how it works. That's it. The Holy Spirit dwells inside your mortal body and he brings eternal life to it. He brings the life of God into a mortal body because that person believes the gospel of Christ. What does that mean for me? Well, it means a dynamic life in time and it means to be for eternity in the presence of the Lord. To be absent from the mortal body because you're saved. is to be in the presence of the Lord forever because you have eternal life. 
You don't get eternal life when you die. You get it while you're alive by believing the gospel. Well, let's have a word of prayer and let's study this. Okay? Let's study it. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The privilege through the new covenant priesthood to confess sin personally. In silence, it could be mental attitude types of sin, overt sins, mental attitude, sins of the tongue, whatever. That confession, according to 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me. That's the benefits of being saved. You need to do that so that the Holy Spirit, according to John 14, 26, can teach you and recall the Word of God to your human soul. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way. Teach us how to live victorious Christian lives every day, no matter what the circumstances. The circumstances do not dictate where the victory is, but our volition does. We choose whether we're going to be spiritual or carnal. We choose. And there's consequences to those choices, both positive and negative. Teach us that today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Notice on your paper, notice on your paper, we're going to do a little, we're going to do a little work here. See the, down on your paper, under Adam, in Adam, I want you to draw a circle. What I got going here, John? I got, it might. No, it's, no. Under in Adam, <laughs> under in Adam, draw a circle. Over, under, in Christ, draw a circle. Are you with me? You have a pencil? If you don't have a pencil, raise your hand. I got a man in the aisle. All right, good. Good. I don't know, uh, Chris, I've got a little circle with a pen. It looks like a pen point. Take, take the top menu up there the, uh, three lines. Yeah. Forget it. <laughs> There's so many things up there. They're trying to trying to figure out which one you're talking about. I don't know. Well, just draw me a circle. Now watch this. In your Bibles, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 15, 22. And we're going to identify these two circles. One circle is in Adam. One circle is in Christ. Right? You got a circle under in Adam, then you got a circle under Christ. Just write circles. I'm going to show you something. 1522. See, it's on your paper. See, it says 1 Corinthians 1522. Let me tell you what it says. It says, in Adam, see the circle under Adam? Write, all die. In that circle that you drew, write, in, see, it says, in Adam all die. That's spiritual death. In Adam, all are dead spiritually. Now, see, every member of the human race is in Adam. You're born in Adam. You've got to be born again to get out of it. I'll show it to you in a moment. Just preliminaries here. Paul says that in Adam, some die, all die. If you're a human being, as opposed to animal, fish, birds, then you're a member of the human race, you're in Adam at birth. And you're spiritually dead. You understand that? Well, I didn't write this. I'm just telling you what it says. All are, all are, all are what? All die. All right, now watch the second part of this. Watch it, 22, I'm still in 22. 
in Adam all die, so also, in contrast, so also, in Christ, all will be made alive. So over there in the circle under Christ, right, all will be alive, spiritually. Agreed? Now, watch this now. Did you write that down? Write that down. Okay. Verse 45. I'm still in 15, so let's drop down to verse 45. The first Adam, which is on your paper in Adam, the first Adam became a living soul, and the last Adam became a life giver. You know who the last Adam is? Christ. Jesus Christ. The first Adam, you read in Genesis, you know, 2 and 3? That's the first one. And he was told, don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil in 2, 2 16, 17. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge. You know, you can eat of all the trees, but don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the day you eat from it, dying you will die. To death. Adam had neither of those prior to eating from the tree. The moment Adam ate from the tree, he now was under two deaths. A spiritual death, separation from God in time, and a physical death that's going to come. 950 years later, it came. When Christ died on the cross, he took care of those two deaths. Write this down. Unless you have it in your head, write this down. John 19, 30, and 31, because he died, a physical, he died a spiritual death first, and he told the Father, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. In other words, he physically died. He died spiritually on the cross, and he died physically. Then his body, then his body was put in a grave, and his soul went to Sheol. It spent three days and three nights in Sheol and then was raised from the dead. The first Adam brought the sin condition and the last Adam was the solution. He goes to the cross, he's buried, he's raised. And Paul identifies that in 1 Corinthians 15 as the gospel. You can see his subject matter flowing through chapter 15. So, you've got a circle there. Now, I want you to put a chair in the middle of Adam's circle. Put a line down in a chair. You know, put a line down in a seat. We're going to call that a throne. Just put a line, just, you know, like a chair. I, don't, I, I drew it this way. You can draw a chair. Yeah, yeah, I don't care. Just put a chair in there. That represents a throne. Right? And somebody's going to reign on that throne. Agreed? And whoever reigns on that throne is the master. Agreed? It's either going to be the sin nature or it's going to be the sin nature or the Holy Spirit, not both at the same time. Agreed? It's one or the other. Watch this now. Did you write that chair on there? That's a throne. Think of that as a throne now. And on that chair, write OSN somewhere. On that chair, write OSN. That's old sin nature. Just to give you an abbreviation. That's your sin nature. We call it the old sin nature because you got it from Adam. Now watch this. Outside that circle under Adam, outside the circle, put an IHS, indwelling Holy Spirit, is outside the circle. See, that's what Paul said in Romans, the eighth chapter. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not saved. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. He said that in Romans, the eighth chapter, 9 through 11. One of many places. Now, here's why that's important, because the unbeliever only has a sin nature. He doesn't have the Holy Spirit, agreed? 
So the question is, if Jesus Christ is the solution to Adam's sin, and he is, these are two federal heads. In verse 45 of 1 Corinthians 15, 45, two federal heads of the human race are identified. One is Adam, and one is Christ. One is called the first Adam, and one is called the last Adam. They're the federal heads of the human race. And either you're in Adam, if you're in Adam, you're what? Spiritually dead. And if you're in Christ, as a member of the human race, you're spiritually alive. My question to you is this. How do you get from being in Adam into Christ? Is that a fair question? All right. So, on your paper, between these two circles... I want you to draw a cross, draw a cross, put a line down from it like this, draw a line down from it, and then a line straight up, and put it, make it an arrow. Because that represents Jesus dying on a cross, being buried, and being raised from the dead to give you eternal life. Paul called that the gospel. The way out of Adam and into Christ, the way out of spiritual death into spiritual life is through the gospel of Jesus Christ and there's no other way. Hmm? Trust and obey for there's no other way. Romans the 15th chapter, 3 and 4. Christ died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead. He died on the cross according to the scriptures. He was buried and raised from the dead according to the scriptures. Don't forget that. These are connected according to the scriptures. Romans 1.16 tells us that you're saved by faith. By believing the gospel. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says that your salvation is a grace gift from God. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is a gift from God. There's no way that you could, no matter how fast you could run or how high you could jump, there's no way you could jump from Adam into Christ. There's no other bridge across from Adam. The first Adam requires the last Adam. The first Adam requires a last Adam. And that last Adam is Jesus Christ. Now watch this. I want you to go to your Bibles to Colossians with me. I'm going to show you how God set up how to get from one circle to the other. By grace. I'm in First Corinthians. I'm in. I'm in Colossians one thirteen. In Colossians one thirteen, it says, "For he rescued us from the domain of darkness." Now watch this. Go, go to the cross. and loop a line from the cross over to Adam. Because Adam is the domain of darkness. And Satan controls the domain of darkness. That's how it goes. And on that line, did you loop it over? On that line that you looped over from the cross to Adam, put an R. Because Paul says, he rescued us. Rescue. That's like a POW. And God has sent in to rescue the POW. The person that's in the slave market of Adam's sin. And God, has a, well, God will rescue you through the gospel of Jesus Christ, will rescue you.
from the domain of darkness. Do you have that on your paper? Now watch. Take another loop from the cross and go over to in Christ. Do another loop. And watch this. He rescues us from the... I'm in, I'm in Colossians 1.13. He rescues us from the domain of darkness and transfers us into the kingdom of his beloved son. Listen to me. You know that loop you went from the cross over to Christ? Over to in Adam? In Christ now? In Christ? Put the word T. Listen. The gospel of Christ, when you believe the gospel of Christ, it reaches in and rescues you from Adam's sin right here to the cross, and from the cross transfers you into the kingdom of light of the beloved Son, the domain of light. You are both rescued and transferred I mean, we see it today in the war of, of the Ukraines being rescued and transferred. Right? They're going to Poland. They're getting on trains and people are sending them all over the world. Either trains or airplanes. They're being rescued and transferred. At the moment of salvation, because of the grace of God and because it's a gift of his grace, he rescues you. And not only does he rescue you, but he transfers you. Into the kingdom of the beloved son. And you're there forever. You can never, once you, once you are rescued and transferred, that's done. See that little pamphlet of 50 things? The moment you got rescued, just the fact of being rescued, the moment you were rescued from the cross, Thirteen judicial charges of Adam's sin upon every human being was removed by the grace of God and the justice of God. By the justice of God, he removed thirteen judicial charges. And it's on your paper. You ought to read that. Not now. That's a study in itself. You were alienated. In Adam, you were alienated. You were spiritually blind. You were cursed. You were condemned. You were at enmity. You were the natural man. You couldn't be spiritual. There was no way you could ever be spiritual because you was a natural man. You were a sukikos, the Greek said. You were perishing. You were a sinner. Sinner, not because you sinned, because Adam did, and you got caught up in it. In that state in Adam, you're ungodly, unrighteous, and under the wrath of God. Those are 13 judicial charges that Adam sent upon the human race that are removed. With the moment you are rescued, that's gone. You're not under that domain of bondage anymore. You ought to be excited. And if you're not, you ought to get saved. This is a wonderful thing. You did nothing to deserve it. But God in His marvelous grace, 2 Peter 3, 9, you ought to write it on your paper, God is not willing that any perish, that's one of the 13 judicial charges, God is not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. I mean, what would keep you today from believing the gospel to be rescued? Here's one. Romans, the fifth chapter, under Adam. Under Adam. 
Romans 5, 12 through 21, probably on your paper. I don't know. Yeah, it's probably on your paper. Listen to this. This is, and sometime I want you to go in and do a study on it. On Romans 5, 12 through 21, I want you to put two columns. Adam and Christ. Put everything that you read in Romans 5, 12 through 21 under Adam and everything that God gives you under Christ, put under Christ. You will be amazed. And that's not a hard study to do, but it's one you should do. In Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 12, listen to what he says. Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin, sin, Adam, sin, entered into the world and death through sin. That's both spiritual and physical. So death spread to all men, for all have sinned in Adam. And he goes on and he makes a great discussion on this. Look at verse 21. Just slip down there because you need to do a study. Just put two columns on your paper later this week and do a study. Everything that's in Adam... Put under one column, under Christ, put another column. You're going to be amazed at what Paul is teaching. Look at verse 21. I'm in Romans 5. So that as sin reigned in death, as sin, and he's talking about Adam's sin, as Adam's sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life. And he's talking about salvation. Later, he's going to come back and he's going to use these terms to talk about spirituality. Here, he's talking about salvation. Later, in this Romans book, he's going to talk about spirituality. He's going to use these terms for spirituality. Now that you're over here, you've got to let the Holy Spirit reign, right? In the Christian life, you have to make a choice. You've got the indwelling, but there's... Listen, you're in charge of who sits on the throne. Please tell me you know that. We just read that in Romans 6. Please, please tell me that. Now, you've got to study this stuff. Listen, if you're used to going to church and just listening, forget what it is. An hour later, somebody says, what did you study? You go like, I don't know, but it was cute. It was cute. It was okay. This is not the church for that. You've got to be a student of the Word of God. Listen, if you're a Christian, you should want to be. You are never going to find victory. You're not going to have any power in your life apart from the Holy Spirit of God. Not even a prayer life. As the old saying goes, you don't even have a prayer without the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's true. The dynamics of the Christian life is lived in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, a 724 deal. I mean, how are you going to win over these things that just tear you up every day? How are you going to win over it? It is simple. In theory, you've got to learn to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. See, I don't have to teach you how to walk in sin. You know how to do that. I have to teach you how to walk in the Spirit because you don't know when the Spirit, you don't have any idea of how the Holy Spirit ministers to your life and your soul. I mean, do you listen to Him at all? Let me tell you. Are you familiar with inner dialogue? Inner dialogue is when you talk to yourself. You talk to yourself? All the time. Quit doing that. You know, you want like quit, quit, Pastor. I know. You need to start, you need to start listening to the Holy Spirit inside your life. Does he live there? He does if you believe the gospel. He lives inside your mortal body. He wants to reign. Do you know he has lust? I just read it. Galatians 5, 16, 17. He lusts for your life to do the things of God. He lusts after the things of God. 
And when you learn to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, you, in your mindset, will begin to lust after the things of God. And one of the ways you'll see the power of it is the effectiveness of your prayer life. Every time, every time you, you, every time you throw a prayer up, you, you hit the target dead on. That's a prayer life. You shouldn't be throwing it up in, with a hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. You throw it up with a confidence, I know. I know in whom I have believed. I know in whom I have believed. Another passage you should read on your own about this transfer business, rescued and transferred, is Acts 26, 18. Be sure to read that. Not now, because I'm through that. When you get through with the cross of Christ, when you believe it, look underneath it, I put, look underneath that. On your paper, I wrote nine blood factors in the 50 things and eight works of the Holy Spirit, all in that cross. The 13 judicial charges are gone, right? Been rescued from them, been transferred. They, they're not transferred with me. They're done. Jesus took the judicial charges for my sin on the cross. Not only that, but I get nine factors of what the blood of Christ did for me. Reconciliation, redemption, propitiation, justification, you know, that group. Eight works of the Holy Spirit. All of that is part of that 50 things. In the circle with Christ, see the circle over there with Christ, in Christ, the circle? Put a chair. That's a throne. Put a throne over there. In that circle, write a throne. On top of that throne, put IHS. Watch this now. And in the circle, put OSN. The moment you get saved, the Holy Spirit takes up residence and he sits on that throne. Compliments of grace salvation. The moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, the old sin nature was kicked off the throne and the Holy Spirit was put on it. The old sin nature is part of the mortal body and he has not left you. Now, it depends on the Christian. Who will he let sit on that throne? Will he let the old sin nature? Let's go, let's go, let's go to James. I'm going to show you how it happens. I started out the Christian life. I had the Holy Spirit on the throne of my life. Because I believed the gospel of Christ. I wanted salvation. I got salvation. And with it came the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He was on the throne at the point of salvation. But I still have a sin nature in my life. Who lust to sin. Here's how this thing works now. Now that I've got the Holy Spirit, I've got the old sin nature in my body. James 1, 14 and 15. Watch this now. Each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. Paul says what you do not want to do is to obey the lust of the sin nature. Temptation is not a sin. Obeying the temptation is. It's not a You're a human being with a mortal body. Come on. Being tempted is not a sin. Watch it now. Listen to what James says. Each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed. 
by his own lust of his sin nature. This is where this warforce, warf, this warfare, they're in opposition to one another in Galatians 5, 16, 7. This is, this is how it plays out. Now we're talking about how, how it functions with the mechanics. When lust has conceived, what is that? It's lust gratification. Lust gratification. In lust gratification, there is pleasure in that sin for a bit. That's why we keep, we keep going back to the well of poison. Because there is pleasure for a fleeting time, there is pleasure in sin. And so we're tempted to go back to the well that's poisoned water. You can correct that. When that temptation comes, what you should do in your inner dialogue, when temptation comes, inner dialogue kicks in. Come on, please tell me. You know inner dialogue. You begin to talk to yourself about this. Moody, how to, how to water Moody. Come on. At that point, you should go to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your inner dialogue. You should go to the Holy Spirit. Because if you stay in the flesh you will wind up in personal sin. Lust gratification, when it's conceived, it brings forth personal sin. And when it does, it brings carnality and death in regard to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in you. Do you understand that? I know. Well, look, you've got to hear this several times to get it. I understand that. I understand that. I understand that well. I've been doing this a long time. Listen, I'm going to keep preaching this until we get it. This is not the first lesson on this in this congregation. And they're probably tired of hearing it. But, you know, you're new with it. You've got to, I've not heard this before. I know. When lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. See there how it works? Temptation is not a sin, but it is a red flag. Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da, da. It's a red flag. Who's paying attention to the red flag? I should be, right? The guy next to me is not, because he don't know what's going on in the inner chamber. But I do. It's inner dialogue. Inner dialogue is taking a look and consideration of what's called temptation. And seeing how that thing would fit into his capacities of the sin nature that he could get pleasure from it. My, my, my. I must be talking to myself. That inner dialogue is a red flag of temptation. A lust of the flesh. Shut it down by going to the Holy Spirit. It's the inner dialogue. And the Holy Spirit has the power over the sin nature, and you don't. If you think you're going to manage this thing, you need to go down to some of these rehab centers and talk with the people. Sir, how many times have you been in here? It's a revolving door. I used to have a ministry, the Jimmy Hill Mission. This is a revolving door. How many times have you been through there? About, about 30. Phew. Aren't you sick of it? Oh, I'm so sick of it. Would you like to have it quit? Yeah. Are you ready to go cold turkey with me? Spiritual cold turkey? Hmm. 
That inner dialogue is really important because it's a red flag. Temptation is a red flag. Do not, do not stay. Do not go for lust of the flesh with the idea of gratifying pleasure. Because in the end, you're drinking from a poison well. A little here and a little there, a little here and a little there, and eventually you're dead. Second Corinthians 5.17 In Christ, you're a new creation in Christ. All things have passed away. Those 13 judicial charges that were upon you, all the things of the 50 that are now present in your life are wonderful. This inner dialogue, you've got to be careful that are not mental attitude, sense, sense of the tongue, or overt sense. See, some people got the idea, well, the mental attitude to sin is not as bad. Listen, for God, sin, sin. It's only we that determine some are worse than others. You know, for some people, physical abuse is worse than verbal abuse. They're both sin in the eyes of God. Mental attitude sins are sins of the tongue. They're sinful. And they're fleshly. And they're not going to be corrected apart from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Write this down. Here's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. If you turn to the Holy Spirit, Ron, if I turn to the Holy Spirit, I know if I go to the flesh what I'm going to get, even though I'm going to only get gratification for a little bit, I know I get a little bit. What do I get from the other deal? So I'm going to shut that down, something I know works, for something I don't know that works. Well, it's called faith. Here's what you get. Write this down. You get, you get Galatians 5, 22, 23. <laughs> I mean, right on the spot. There it is. Galatians 5. You're going to be familiar with this. Maybe not in the context I just put it. He said the fruit of the Spirit, he gives you nine. Listen to me. It's not plural fruits. It's singular. Even though he described them in plurality. You know why they're singular? Because they all come from the Holy Spirit. Do you know why they're plural? Because they're individually important to your life. Well, here they are, and you're familiar with them. Love. This is not human love. This is divine love. All of these are not human. They're divine. They're produced by the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. My, my, my. Self-control? I thought I had to take a pill for that. Oh, Ron, if I could... If I just, if I just had self-control over by eating... You do. A fruit of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is called self-control. So when you're tempted, go to the Holy Spirit because he gives you a positive. Rather than go back for that third piece of cake and unloosen your belts and... and uh, Stand up, your pants fall down because you ain't got nothing, no way to support that whole business. There it is. Well, we're going to take, I don't know, where's my man? Do I have, William, are there, are there baskets back there? Al, Al's got it. All right, Al, let's, let's take an offering. Rick, I don't know where Rick is. Okay, Al, give us a word of prayer. And then he. grateful for your grace and mercy. Thank you for all that you've given us and all that you have for us and our people. We have great hope for our people, Father. So give us a generous heart to share with uh, the ministry what, what we're supposed to and uh, give us security about our own. We love you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the man will take the offering. Now, when we come back to the second hour, 
I want to deal with the other, there, there are three circles now that are really going to be important. And when we come back to that second hour, I'm going to deal with the other two linked to the third. Okay? So, we need to really get a hold of this. This is where victory in the Christian church is, right here. And uh, it's really important that we get this under our belt. 